Hey guys, what's up today? How we doing? So I wanted to talk to you guys today about Plato and Socrates. First, for those of you guys who don't know, Plato wrote about Socrates and Socrates didn't write anything. And so that's the first interesting point that we're going to make here today. A lot of people talk about Plato and who he was as a person. And one thing that I have come to learn is maybe everyone's wrong. So in asking maybe the whole world is wrong about Plato and Socrates, we have to look at the people who thought about that first. <laughs> First person to uh, talk to me, obviously, would be my professor, who introduced me to this philosopher named Mitchell Miller. He was a philosopher in the 80s, 90s, and then retired in 2013, according to his Wikipedia page. But Mitchell Miller wrote a lot of books about Plato, and yeah, he was pretty much a philologist about all of Plato and everything about him. And because he's a more recent thinker, he has pretty much gone through everyone else, assumably, who has studied Plato. One person that comes to mind is Nietzsche, who I talked about in a different video. He studied the Greek classics hard freaking core, and he talked a lot about things just not being true. And so when I came across this Mitchell Miller piece about maybe everything we know about Plato and Socrates being absolutely bonkers, I was like, yeah, maybe. So that's what I wanted to introduce to you guys today. And I did uh, add a link at the bottom to another book that I found uh, completely available online. But what we read for class was a chapter from his book called The Philosopher in Plato's Statesman. So The Statesman is a book that I have never read before and we're reading Phaedrus for class. So the book Phaedrus is just one of three that we're reading this semester. Um, the other ones I don't remember the name of exactly, but we're pretty much reading this like 90 page book for the past seven weeks. I don't know how long, um, but it's been very, very interesting just going like paragraph by paragraph and the notes and all of the extra reading um, on Plato. It's been very, uh, very, very, very interesting. <laughs> So the main core of what I wanted to talk to you guys today was about Socrates' mimetic irony. And I tried to Google this for the paper we had to write, and I couldn't find almost anyone else talk about mimetic irony, like, anywhere on Google. It just didn't exist. And so that's, like, the main reason why I wanted to make this video, because it is super interesting and... Probably it's been heard of or talked about by other people and just not used in this exact term, mimetic irony, but who knows? It could be totally unique. So first what I did was I googled the word mimetic because uh, I'd never heard that before and what I found was it was from the word mimesis. What it means is to imitate. That, that, it is that simple, to imitate. But more so, it means to represent or to more imitate the behavior or the mindset of someone you're talking to or an audience in front of you. And that's pretty much exactly what Socrates does. He just puts on a facade and mirrors the person he's talking to. And in Phaedrus, he actually almost says that quite literally. He says, allow me to put a veil over my face as to not think you think I'm me at the moment. That was during his first speech. Which, which if you guys want me to do a whole video on Phaedrus itself, I would totally love to. Mimetic irony has four compositional parts. It's a, a certain structure to almost a debate, but really like a conversation or a platonic dialogue, as we philosophers would say. <laughs> First part is when the philosopher goes up to someone and asks them for their opinion, or pretty much like a, a small speech on what they believe is to be a fact. It's pretty much like going up to someone and being like, hey, tell me everything you know about your 
everything. Tell me everything. What's interesting about Socrates is he always says that he doesn't know anything. I know nothing. Uh, I'm just a humble little philosopher roaming in the darkness. Uh, there's actually a really beautiful piece. I have no idea. I read so, so, so much. But in something I read, it says that we're in the darkness, but it's better than being in the light of ignorance. And it's pretty much this beautiful, so Socratic, nihilistic, beautiful look on life. And I love it. Ignorance is no good. Gotta leave that. Okay, so the philosopher goes up to a person, and then this person is called the interlocutor. Um, that's the, the fanciful term people use for when you're debating someone. He goes up to them, and with his uh, mindset in mind, like, I know nothing, and almost everyone else thinks they know something, and I have to prove them otherwise. And so he goes up to someone, and he's like, tell me your thing so I can disprove it pretty much. But they don't know that second part. And so the second part of the mimetic irony is where uh, Socrates or the philosopher would pretend to have sympathy with the interlocutor and agree with most points about their speech, but then would subtly start to pick and knit at each part and then would totally disrupt their whole thing. It's like when you're saying something and someone just keeps going, oh, oh, what, what is that? What do you mean by that? And then slowly but surely, Socrates would break down the logic of whoever he's talking to. And then that slides us right into the third phase of the mimetic ironies, compositional structure which is when the interlocutor has completely lost his, his logic, his argument, and he's, he's now contradicting himself and he can't even help it. So one word that was taught to me is called aporia, and this means an irreversible internal contradiction or logical yeah, just a, a complete cognitive dissonance in someone's logic and theory where they can't even fathom what Socrates is saying. And they're like, did I put my whole life to nothing? Should I just give up on everything? And then this is the third step where Socrates introduces what's called the reorienting insight where he will almost re-give the speech in uh, the context of Phaedrus, that is. He re-gives the speech and just messes it all up to where it does agree with the original speech, but not to a certain extent that it did in the original. Like, he fixes it, but completely uh, surpasses the original logic and disproves it entirely. Yes, this giving of the 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 re-speech, the reorientating insight, is what takes the person from the third phase to the fourth phase, which is called the exegesis. This is the point in which the non-philosopher, the interlocutor, has to open their mind and pretty much choose for themselves whether or not they're going to realize they're wrong or else Socrates has to start over again. The purpose of this uh, compositional structure of the mimetic irony is to let the interlocutor have their own possibility or their own route to find their contradiction or to actually examine their own self, realize in themselves that they're wrong. And some of the things that I read or think Socrates uses the mimetic irony to kind of change the minds of the person they're talking to, but also Plato probably writes these dialogues in the way that he does to allow the reader kind of a chance to do the same thing, like find their own self-examine, their own self-contradictions, where uh, Socrates is just asking questions and the reader could, you know, ask themselves, like, I wonder what it is, I don't know. 
Um, because I think in a real sense, Socrates never like alludes to any real conclusions. But in a big way, a lot of people think that he does, and that Plato does have very distinct doctrines. And I don't think that's that's true at all. One of the things that Plato is known for is called the world of perfect forms. And in Phages, things that are there are like beauty and love and self-control. <laughs> this world of perfect forms is just a world of abstract thoughts and concepts pretty much corporealized into this perfect form, quite literally, the thing in itself. But a lot of people will argue that the world of perfect forms could never exist. Like, the argument goes, perfect forms wouldn't exist because different breeds of dogs wouldn't be able to exist. The perfect dog would exist in the world of perfect forms, but humans can change the form of dog, therefore the perfect forms don't exist. And it's just like, yes, that's true, but Plato was talking about abstract concepts. A dog is not an abstract concept. Obviously, people just love to argue philosophical thoughts, and that's pretty much our thing. We're always just picking on each other, basically. Um, but I don't know. I feel like with the use of mimetic irony and thinking about the fact that Socrates is mirroring his audience and talks about whatever they want to talk about, it makes it hard to actually judge what Socrates thinks about anything, his opinions on things. One thing that we went over in class, and I really wanted to share it with you guys too, was that speech and writing have major deficiencies when it comes to communicating. And this is something I know perf uh, personally, specifically articulating sentences for this. But what my professor says is that our mind's insight cannot be perfectly articulated with language. And because humans created language and language constantly evolve, uh, and the words we say, the words meanings constantly evolve, we can never actually fully encompass the words we read, like when they're from the ancient 2,000 years ago past. And sure, we can um, read Greek language, but abstract thought is very... Like, human beings have abstract thoughts, and that is a very explosive, like, that's why we are different from every other animal. One idea that I had was, uh, like, in the Egyptian pyramids, in the hieroglyphics, you can see where slaves are being hit by people with whips to build things. And one idea I had was, what if they weren't just being whipped and hit constantly, as they are portrayed in, like, TV shows or, like, movies, The Prince of Egypt, but <laughs> rather, like... The symbol just meant that they were under control and that there was an authority above them. Not that they were being whipped, like, constantly. Like, maybe, like, once every five minutes. But not at all how it's portrayed in The Prince of Egypt or other movies. But a lot of people just think about Plato as this guy who thinks these, like, radical thoughts. Like, I've heard people think of him as someone who believes that we're in the matrix and that we're not really here. So now I'm just like, I think you're reading it wrong, son. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to just say that, and I usually don't, but I do kind of try to be like, I don't, I disagree. I, I want to, can it mind if I pop in there, say something? <laughs> you got to be nice about it. A few more deficiencies in writing and speech that we talked about in class, other than the fact that they're words made by humans, which are fallible and uh, wrong, <laughs> or can be very wrong, 
Anyways, so the major deficiencies in writing and speech is that when Socrates uses his mimetic irony, he is being very specific to who he is talking to, and he knows exactly the mindset and the inner workings of the audience and who he's trying to pretty much manipulate into being a philosopher, (laughs) not anything bad. But what this shows in the deficiencies of writing, to which I keep wording it that way because that's how I have written it in my notes, the deficiencies in writing are that they don't know their audience. They don't know exactly who they're talking to, and so they can't adjust their language or pretty much almost the topic, too, that they're talking. Like, the analogy that they use for the audience to make every philosophical concept up like as perfectly clear as can be and then another point was that writing or just speeches given can't necessarily defend themselves what's really interesting about hosting a youtube page is that i more or less can defend myself to which i really do like to talk to you guys Uh, i love the opposite idea I messaged Josh Ergo and I told him how much his video inspired me and he ended up watching mine and that was super awesome and he was like, oh, I loved your video, but I totally, I don't agree. And I was like, what? Please, tell me. We ended up messaging back and forth a bunch of times and I think we did agree. I think we were somewhat on the same page about things, but that's the exact messed thing up about language is like, I can explain myself to you guys, but then I can go back and watch my video like five times and I'm like crap I should have just said like like this one sentence that would have encompassed the whole thing and that that would have been a great conclusion to the whole story sorry my puppy's scratching at me another thing with other than defending itself is that a reader can't necessarily ask questions like explanatory questions like for example if you don't have a dictionary next to you full of words concepts or like a lot of philosophers like to use ancient mythological stories and I'm like I got no idea what you're talking about dog I'm obviously not their audience at that point so that those are just a couple of the reasons why a lot of people could say that no one knows a darn tootin' thing about Socrates because he just talked about what everyone else wanted to talk about in order to best teach them, in order to best move them into the direction he wanted them to go into, uh, using whatever analogy or story or thematic tale. In Phaedrus, I'm sure Socrates didn't want to talk about the love between a boy and a man, but he did. And that's what he had to do in order to teach Phaedrus that his teacher, Lysias, was kind of an idiot. <laughs> I'm gonna finish up. Really got to go to bed. But I really enjoy talking to you guys. Uh, leave me a message down below. Comment what you guys think. And definitely if you've thought the same thing while reading any Plato or reading any Nietzsche or just reading anything. And you're just like, is this true? Because I'd always take a grain of salt with everything you read or listen to. Definitely keep in mind anyone could just be manipulating you. Even the best philosopher, Socrates. <laughs> so if you guys wanted a chance to buy any of my artwork that I've been drawing for the YouTube channel, I've been posting it on this website called Redbubble who prints artwork on products, and it's super awesome. I'd love for you guys to check it out and message me if you do buy anything, and maybe even send me a picture. I'd love to see. I was thinking about ordering a couple of stickers myself, just because they're so, so, so cute, and my laptop could always use more stickers. Check it out, comment below, subscribe, like, um, share, and shout from the rooftop how much you love philosophy. <laughs> I love you guys. Bye-bye. Have a great night. Bye.